think we can agree that the most talked about Hi-Fi product of 2023 has been the Eversolo A6. And we can probably agree that the most hyped Hi-Fi product of 2023 has also been the Eversolo A6. And I don't know about you, but all of that talk and hype definitely made me skeptical. And I've had one here for a number of months, but I just wanted to wait, wait for all of that to settle and calm down because I felt by now lots of people will have owned one and they'll be able to tell the difference between the truth and hype. So I suppose the pertinent question to ask is, has the Eversolo A6 been overrated or underrated? And I can see why audiophiles have been excited about the Eversolo A6, because it's like a mini Hi-Fi Rose. Its styling is almost carbon copy, just smaller and a lot more affordable. And it's the price that really stands out. £750 or thereabouts for what you get, at least on the outside, because I've got to be honest, the casework styling and build quality, and of course, the very bright, very clear touchscreen display, and the very Auralic like illuminated surround control knob, it's all very nice and all very familiar, but not at this price point. And I think it's that price that really opens up the Eversolo A6 to more people, definitely to newcomers to Hi-Fi, more so than products, I think, from maybe Aurelic and Hi-Fi Rose, just as an example. And then that means it's in competition with lots of other products that I think look very plain, look very simple, look very boring, and very unattractive by comparison. And of course, die-hard audio files might think that the casework and the fancy screen is not that important, but of course, it is important, especially to newcomers to Hi-Fi. And I have the other most talked about Hi-Fi product in 2023 here, also the Wim Pro Plus. And I have been comparing them because the Wim costs a lot less, but does a lot of the same. And as we all know, the kicker when it comes to audio products is if the beauty is only skin deep, it won't be deep enough. And looking inside the A6, it has a nice layout, of power supply on one side, the analog section the other side, and all our streaming and digital bits in the middle, mostly hidden underneath a big heatsink. In a way, it's a shame that it's hard to see many of the highlight technical features, such as the dual ESS Sabre 9038 Q2M DAC chips used in a double differential quadruple setup to supposedly improve dynamic range and lower noise. The preamplifier circuit we can see, and it's a fully balanced design said to improve noise and performance. And I think I could also see the dual clocks that are said to improve digital file sampling and reduce jitter. And I am no engineer, so I'm not in a position to assess the merits of a circuit design, but I can say that I cannot fault the build quality really of the Eversolo A6 inside and out. And it's interesting when you remove the bottom section to expose the inside, you see how thick this aluminium casework is, which is surprisingly thick considering how light the Eversolo A6 is. But one thing I've noticed is, oh, man, I really like the finish quality, but you can see, and hopefully you can see on camera, that it fingerprints really very easily. And I've normally cleaned Hi-Fi products with a 3M screen cleaner because it's like an evaporative cleaner, but I've noticed that's left a little bit of like, kind of like a, a slight blemish to the casework here. So my advice is just be very careful what you clean your lovely Eversolo A6 with. Now let's talk about the bit that's probably the most exciting to most people, the six inch LCD touchscreen that's very bright, very clear with great colors. And it reminds me of the screen in the NAD M10 V2, only it's nicer and even higher quality. And I am personally not a fan of touchscreens on Hi-Fi products because I don't want fingerprints all over it, but I do really like this screen. I really like the animations when you power the A6 on. I think some will, of course, really like the VU meters because it's a nice feature and VU meters are cool. I personally preferred the Spectro purely because it was much easier for me to see sat at a distance away. And that is the reality here of this screen. For me, it's very nice, but it's not big enough to be any more than a nice gimmicky feature for me because I just couldn't see it clearly enough sat at my listening position. So I prefer to change the screen over to the screensaver and then it just shows the time and the date with a cool animation where the date and time swap places every so often. 
So the screen alone, despite me really, really liking it, it definitely wouldn't be enough for me to buy the Ever Solo A6 on its own because I just wouldn't really see the real use in it. However, your mileage may well vary. But I do really like the illuminated ring around the volume or control wheel. It's a minor thing, but I think it looks really nice. And I value it as much, maybe even more, than the screen for the aesthetic appeal of this design. And I must say, I have been impressed with all of the connection options. Yes, the aerials for Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are external, but they are styled nicely. Not the shitty black plastic cheap ones I hate seeing on Hi-Fi products, excuse my language. And there is a good selection of digital inputs and outputs that I think will cover most bases for most people, but not all, as there is no HDMI input and the HDMI output is not I2S. But the HDMI output can support multi-channel surround from SACD. And I don't really understand why we would want that in a product like this, but that's just because I don't listen to that format of music. And for functionality, there is a huge amount of support here for all different types of music file playback stored in different places. And I'm not going to go over it all. I'm just going to focus on what stood out to me. First is the ability as a customer to install an NVMe hard drive to store your own music files internally or locally. And this is really easy to do. You simply remove the panel from the underside of the A6 using the included screwdriver. And then you install the NVMe drive of your choice, I think up to four terabytes. I really like this idea. And if this was going to be a long-term thing for me, if the A6 was gonna be you know, my source going into the future, well then it would be the first thing I would do is install an NVMe drive loaded with my you know, previously ripped music. But I find these days I'm pretty lazy. I generally stream a lot of music from Tidal. And interestingly with a recent firmware update, the Eversolo A6 and I assume other Eversolo products now support Tidal Max. And that's great on paper, but I'm not sure if I've seen any real difference to streaming before Max and now after Max, but it's great to have that supported here. Now we need to talk about the Eversolo control app, which is a very good app. I found it to be a little cumbersome, but it's been rock solid with no main issues since the recent updates. It's visually a very nice app, and that definitely appeals to me. And I think in the main, it's simple to use, such as selecting what source we want to play music from and what output we want to send our music essentially to, with quick access to some important parameters for that output. The settings overall I think do feel a little cumbersome because there are so many options in one long list. But to be fair, the display settings are all very straightforward and I like being able to adjust not only the screen brightness but also the volume wheel ring brightness. And we can select from different VU meters and different spectrum modes, but I do wish there was a little more customization here, such as being able to select the colors that we want to use for each design. But maybe that's asking too much from a hi-fi product. It's not a phone after all. The audio settings are pretty straightforward, but I think some of the terminology used, such as with the options for DSD, I think would be overwhelming for a hi-fi beginner. So my advice on that would be, if you don't know what the options are or do, just leave them as they are. And if you're going to use the A6 as a streaming DAC, then definitely pay attention to the XLR slash RCA audio settings as you can adjust between seven different DAC filter modes. And these change the sound presentation a little bit, so there is a little bit of sound tuning available here. I preferred the brick wall filter because it seemed to be the best balance between good bass and not too over exuberant mids and highs without losing the music's energy, but at the sacrifice of a little bit of the obvious crispy details. A couple of settings I would suggest you pay attention to would be the volume pass through, which will always set the volume to maximum for when you're using another volume control device in the system, like an integrated amplifier or a pre-amplifier, definitely don't turn that on if you're connecting straight to a power amplifier. 
Another option to pay attention to would be sampling rate, because I found that you could use this a little bit like a tone control, which again is useful for some sound tailoring, and we'll talk more about this shortly. And that leads me nicely onto talking about sound quality. And I think with the retail price of around 750-ish pounds, the A6, I haven't really got too much to grumble about here with the A6. It's, it delivers good in a lot of important key areas, but it's definitely not perfect. Of course, we can't expect that. I have been testing it in a very high-end system, playing direct to the Griffin Essence Stereo Pure Class A power amplifier, driving the Mission 770 speakers, but also using the Bespoke Audio Passive Preamplifier 2, which acts like a beauty filter to the music, but I also think it better separates the left and right channels for more clarity in the overall soundstage. So these are very expensive components for sure, but they easily allow me to hear what the A6 is and is not doing. And the mission speakers are transparent enough, but not too demanding on the gear to sound good. So they are a nice compromise. And I also tested the A6 purely as a streamer, feeding into the Chord Electronics Hugo TT2 as the DAC to see what the difference might be. And of course the sound got a lot better. There is no need to deep dive that I feel just know that it's possible to use the A6 with a better DAC to get better sound quality. But looking at the Eversolo A6 in isolation, as I mentioned, I found it sound to be good. Good in most key and important areas. It ticks most important areas. There's good energy, there's good soundstage, there's good clarity, there's good timing, there's good bass, there's good tonality to the overall sound, and there's definitely good kind of detail and separation. And there's a lot going on with the music that is always good and always consistent. And there was a few areas that I found to be slightly better than good. One of them would be within what I would call small details, little intricacies, little intricacies within the music or the small details I found really stood out and really popped. I found that very impressive. And also the treble presence. There was very clearly, or the treble presence, or just the treble information was very present and very clear and very precise. Now that can be a good thing. <laughs> And it is quite a good thing, funnily enough, to get that from the Mission 770 speakers because they are quite a relaxed speaker. But it does make me think if you have, you know, a different room to this, this is an acoustically treated room, if you have different gear, different speakers, well then that treble presence could be seen maybe as more of a, more of a con than a pro. But for me, in this system, it was definitely a pro. And what also stood out to me was the timing of the music, the information or the way the Information was given to me from the speakers in a very organized and very clear fashion from top to bottom, treble through to bass. That I found really impressive because that also meant there was a very nicely organized soundstage with, with the right music, very nice width to it, and again with the right music, some depth to it. And by that I mean width is you know sounds that come from very clearly outside of the speakers and depth would be sound that very clearly comes from beyond the speakers like behind the speakers positioned in you know a pseudo three-dimensional soundstage and of course all of this was very impressive now i did find when i was listening to music quite loudly as i do maybe after about two hours ish i was finding i was becoming quite fatigued and i think that is because of the big pros of the a6 the fact that it has this very detailed sound that's quite exuberant or a little bit forward in presentation so the energy of the music really wants to get out of you all of the time of all of these small details i found that that was putting me into quite an active listen kind of mode you know i couldn't really you know switch off too much i couldn't really relax i was always paying attention which of course becomes very tiring or can become tiring but i think that is because there just wasn't enough refinement to go along with that to make me be able to just relax it was kind of keeping me a little bit tense as i was listening to music and I found with some music, the A6's presentation was quite analytical of that music. And then it seemed to punish that music or me for selecting it. Not terribly, but enough for me to want to move on to something a little more smooth sounding. But all of these things are me being very critical because in isolation, there is a lot to like here about how the A6 sounds. And you could build a system around it to best maximize its strengths and minimize its shortcomings and you can happily use it as a streaming DAC and a preamplifier. I didn't notice 
a, a drastic change or too much change in sound using it at different volume levels feeding straight into the Griffin amplifier. So that could save you money. It could save you money on you know, not buying an integrated amplifier or a pre-amplifier and just using a power amplifier, which is great. However, <laughs> not going through the bespoke passive pre-amplifier, I definitely lost some refinement. I definitely lost some openness and spaciousness and some of that really nice soundstage that I mentioned before. And instead, the sound was, I'd say, a bit more congested, a bit more kind of clotted together. And the timing wasn't as good. So yes, using a good integrated or maybe a good preamplifier could get you better sound. But in saying that, I did find that the A6 sounded a bit thicker and a bit bolder, as it always does. The sound always does when it's kind of a bit clotted together. It naturally sounds a bit bolder. That means it sounds a bit warmer. So while it's not technically as good, you might find it a bit more pleasing. So you could, as I mentioned, build a system around the A6 to suit your specific taste. But then I compared the A6 to the People's Champion streaming DAC, the WinPro Plus. And this to me is a very interesting comparison because it's quite clear the EverSolo as a product is a much nicer and more lovely thing to look at and interact with physically and offers better connections. But the WIM goes toe to toe for features at a lot less money. So if your choice between them was purely based on sound quality because you're happy with the look and the physicality of the products and you're happy with the features that they both offer, if it purely comes down to sound quality, you know, what is the difference and how do I feel about that? Especially if you're considering the upgrade from the WIM to the Ever Solo. Well, straight out of the box, the Ever Solo sounds significantly better than the WIM in every area. It's not even close. The WIM sounds more subdued, smaller in scale, leaner in bass, duller in the treble, less expansive, and just not nearly as good in any area, which I think we should expect with a price delta of three times as much for the Ever Solo. But here is where things get a little more interesting because I've already worked out a way how to get better sound from the WIM products using the built-in graphic equalizer. So using the settings that I created that I've posted before, I was able to massively close the gap between the two products in sound to the point where it became God, I'm kind of nitpicking, you know, picking small differences. I preferred the WIM because I could make it sound bolder and more powerful and full in the bass. So there's more fullness to the sound in, the, in between the speakers. That all sounds more solid. And that then makes vocals have better tonality and the whole sound is stronger, warmer, bolder, more bassy and more pleasing to me. However, the Ever Solo has that really nice timing. So the timing of the music from the Ever Solo is better and the small details really pop more. But it's also a more exuberant upfront kind of listen, whereas the Wim is a bit more relaxed and a bit more easygoing and a bit more maybe listened to for longer periods of time without fatigue type of listen. So this is really quite interesting and it shows the power of that graphic equalizer setting within the Wim. And it also shows that the Ever Solo, I think, is missing some really important features, maybe some sound tailoring options, which could be as simple as warm, bright and neutral. Or it could be better, give us some manual control over the sound with an equalizer or similar or better yet. Your product like the Ever Solo could give us direct live room correction and we could do some amazing things with that. But coming back to our comparison, the fact that I've had to use an equalizer on the whim to make it sound better, to make it sound even remotely close to the Ever Solo is actually not a good thing. It's like a, a band-aid approach, really. And also, it's not perfect. In some music, I do find, I do hear an odd anomaly here and there, which is possibly some digital clipping happening within the system. And this is definitely not a good thing. I don't think it's a harmful thing to anybody's system, but it's definitely not a good thing. So again, this is like a, a band-aid approach to try and get better sound from the whims. And I would rather not take that approach really, but I will take it, I will take it because everything sounds significantly better for the odd song that maybe throws up some kind of anomaly. 
Now I did find that it was possible to close the gap again by using the Ever Solo's upsampling features and I found the sweet spot to be I think 176.4 kilohertz. And what that did was just kind of thicken and bolden the sound from the A6 to make it sound more like the whim with my equalizer on, like the kind of warmer, bolder sound to just take off the edge of its kind of over, ex over exuberance. And the cool thing about using the upsampling is we don't lose that exuberant sound. We don't lose the energy. We don't lose the details. I found it just to kind of, it just thickens and emboldens the sound a little bit, which maybe is technically, technically worse if you measured it, but I don't care about that. It's like, it's a nicer, more pleasing, more enjoyable you know, system to listen to like that. So it's like a like a minor tweak thing, something I'd suggest people to give a try. So it's a minor tweak. And again, it just shows to me that, yeah, really the Ever Solo could really do with some sound tailoring options that would make it more flexible and make it more appealing sonically or more compatible maybe with different systems, different rooms, and just different tastes. So for my final thoughts then, I suppose I need to answer the question, do I think the Ever Solo A6 has been overrated or underrated? And that is an extremely difficult question to answer. But I can also see why there's been a lot of talk and a lot of hype around the A6, because it is a very, very lovely thing. I think the, the build quality, the screen, the way that all is for the price point really is very impressive, really is very interesting. But I would say that, or my advice to anyone considering it would be, yeah, it's a really lovely thing and you're not gonna be disappointed with it as a product. And you possibly wouldn't be disappointed with it sonically either. Like I said, it, it sounds good in lots of important areas and maybe it's perfect within its own designed sound characteristic. But I think its sound won't please everybody. Of course, nothing ever does, but it definitely won't please everyone. And it's definitely not some all conquering digital streaming DAC, you know, type of device. Definitely not. Doesn't make it a bad device. It's a very good, very well thought out, very well supported, very lovely thing. It's just not perfect and definitely not all conquering. So I hope you've enjoyed this review. I hope you found it useful and helpful. If you've enjoyed it, please hit the thumbs up button. If you appreciate my take on hi-fi reviewing, maybe consider subscribing to the channel. If you'd like access to the WIM EQ settings that I mentioned in this video, well, then they're available on my Patreon. I think it's three pounds to sign up for that to get access to those. Or maybe just consider supporting me on Patreon if you appreciate what I do for you here.